and thank you for joining. My name is Tracy Cook and I'm the online media manager for modernanalyst.com, the premier community for business analysts. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar entitled The Digital Design Professional for Today's Digital Ecosystem. Today's featured speaker is Kim Larenroth. Kim is the first chair of the International Requirements Engineering Board, IREB, and chief requirements engineer at ADESO. This webinar will last approximately 60 minutes, including the question and answer session at the end. Please be sure to submit your questions in advance using the questions feature of the GoToWebinar software. And now I'd like to say thank you to IREB for sponsoring this event. And at this time, I'll turn it over to Stan Buner to say a few words to get us started. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Um, yeah, I'm happy to be here today. Um, let me shortly introduce myself. So my name is Stan Bühner. I'm the Vice Managing Director of the International Requirements Engineering Board. The IREP itself is a non-profit organization that was founded somewhere in 2006 by some leading experts in requirements engineering, having the goal to increase the awareness of requirements engineering skills and to improve requirements engineering in practice. So currently we are offering the CPRE certification with um, different certifications um, for foundation and advanced levels in different directions. Um, at the moment we are having about 65 certified requirements engineering professionals in more than 80 countries worldwide. And um, in addition, we are also um, publishing a um, requirements engineering magazine with um, some really interesting articles. So if you're interested, just follow us um, at the link. And um, if you're thinking for sure now or currently, we are having um, the idea of requirements engineering. So the IREP in general is the home of requirements engineering, but for sure, we are also looking outside um, of the box and um, some smart guys, one of them is Kim, um, were um, talking to us and they were telling us, hey, um, in the current environment, in the digital age, we need something new, something that goes beyond requirements engineering. We really need some people that have knowledge about the abilities and the limitations of the, of the material, the digital material and um, that they are able to really create the best solution that fits the market, that brings some innovation into the market. And that's why we created um, a new education scheme, what is a digital design professional. Um, the goal or our major goal of the digital design professional is to empower the existing roads in software engineering. Let's talk it like a product owner, a business analyst, requirements engineer, or user interface designer to really understand the need um, to understand the whole digital solution and to craft with the digital material, similar as a building architect does. And this education scheme will be available in fall this year. And um, Kim will give some insights in his presentation about this um, about the digital design professional and now i'm happy to hand over to kim who is the first chair of the irep and also um, one of the pioneers and initiators for the digital design professional kim over to you thank you very much stan for the kind introduction I, we already mentioned, Stan already mentioned um, architecture, not software architecture, but building architecture as a topic that was very important for us when we developed the digital design professional. We did a lot of um, visits in universities, having a look at how people study industrial design and architecture. And what I found very interesting is that programs in architecture teach perception of architecture, which means that the students go out in the city and watch at buildings, watch at streets. So the picture you see here has many different aspects that a trained architect can see. You have the street, you have the colors, you have the form and the shape of the buildings, and all these have certain effects on people. And if an architect is not trained to see and to work with these effects and these materials, it's very difficult for him or her to create great buildings. And in the same sense, 
this talk will be about the perception of digital material and i hope i can give you some insights how we start seeing digital material as a thing that we can use to shape solutions but before we go into the details i want to share some introduction thoughts with you which are from my point of view very important to understand the current situation and why we need something like the digital design professional when you look at the IT department industry history you can see that here on this on the picture we 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 um, we have have still have a, a gap between a the gap between technical possibilities and the expectations of our customers a major event in this history was the um, Apollo 11 on the moon there we we had tremendous technical capabilities which were made us able to send people to the moon and back in a safe way and Margaret Hamilton there was a, was a great person who called herself a software engineer and made most out of technology there but in the mainstream in IT and techn technical business we always had this gap between what customers want and what our technical possibilities could achieve and a major another event in this history we was the dot com crash in the year 2000 where we the, the technical possibilities were simply not able to to fulfill all the expectations of people which ended up in a great crash and in the aftermath of this crash something amazing happened i always say that the first iphone in 2007 is uh, the turning point there where we suddenly got technical possibilities on a on a quality level and a level of availability, mobile internet, portable technology, which made digital technology available to everybody. And we suddenly had possibilities that we were not able to think about. The, the slide also shows other things like 3D printing, 5G internet, artificial intelligence, and so on. All these technical possibilities are now there. And the point is we can do much more with our technical capabilities than our customers could imagine. And this is really a, a paradigm shift in the way we develop digital solutions. When we look at digital ecosystems, we always try to distinguish three stages in the way digital ecosystems can evolve. The first important step is the shift from analog to digital data. Here you see typical examples, you see a CD, you see electronic money, or you see the good old teletext from the television screen, which is somehow the internet 20, 30 years ago. And all these steps represent digital data, which gave us new possibilities to do things in a different way. But the, 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 only the media, only the data changed. The way we used the things are more or less stayed the same. The next step in digital ecosystems are digital processes. Here we can use technology to really create fully digital processes. A good example here is the iPod and the iTunes store where you can buy music in a complete online fashion. You can even pay with digital cash and download the music file onto your iPhone or your iPod. And the third stage in digital ecosystems is what we call digital transformation, where really the ecosystem starts to change. Here I have again three examples. A good one is Spotify as a popular streaming service for music, which really changes the way people listen to music, but not only the way people listen to music, also the way people sell music. This is even more important from a ecosystem point of view because Spotify and other streaming services change the way people pay for music and also the way artists are paid for music. For example, in Spotify, you have a so-called stream share. That means that artists get a certain amount of the money made by Spotify depending on the intensity people listen to their music. If you have a popular song, you will get a lot of money from Spotify. If not, not. And this is really a game changer in the music business and changes the way people work or Indiegogo or Kickstarter as an alternative for traditional credit, um, financing systems for projects. And if you come back to the, to the history slide, an important observation is that our methods are all created somewhere behind uh, before all this technology has been invented for example my home discipline requirements engineering was 
invented in 1977 or interaction design has been invented in 1984 usability engineering goes back to 1993 and the first uh, the agile manifesto 2001 everybody knows i hope and the first babok draft was published in 2005 which simply means that all these methods have been invented in a time period where there was this gap between expectations and technical possibilities and the main driver for all our methods is the principle of scientific analysis which means that you carefully have to analyze what customers may want want to achieve and then build a solution from it and this has an impact on the way we shape our roles or our professions for example here you see business analysis, interaction design, requirements engineering, and so on, is really concerned about the environment, about the context where a solution will be used. We use interview techniques, we use observation techniques, we carefully analyze what our customers do, and then we create concepts or so-called specifications that our technical colleagues from software architecture, database engineering, software engineering, and so on, use to build software use technology to create the solutions that we define in our concepts based on their understanding of our customers of our environment and in an important observation from the industrial design community is that industrial design or design in general is an important different way of behaving of working here the quote says that scientific method is something employed in finding out in the, what exists in the nature whereas design is a pattern of behavior that deals with inventing things of value which do not yet exist and this is a real paradigm shift from my point of view because you no longer only look out what's there you start to build things yourself and this really means that when you take all these levels again you have to change the way you address all these different levels which means when from a digital design perspective we of course have to understand the context the environment in which we are working we have to create concepts and specifications because these are our main tools but we also have to understand the level of software and technology in a way that we are able to deal with them that we understand their capabilities and limits to create new solutions from early on and on the other hand we have digital engineers which is not the topic here of the webinar but it's a complementary discipline or profession that wants to reinvent how we build and really develop digital solutions I often get the question, hey, you're talking about digital design and in fact, you're talking about software. And I always say that software is this point of view. You look at the device, you see user interfaces, you even could see class diagrams and so on. But if you think digital, you see the whole person, you have to understand the whole picture. And it's again, a kind of paradigm shift that you see the system, the solution that you are building through the eyes of the customer and from the top of the customer which means that you also have to understand the overall system the overall form of the solution that you will develop and in a minute i will come to this in more detail for us digital design has various layers the most important one is that a digital design professional takes responsibility for the design of a digital solution this is something we learned from building architects and industrial designers. They really live for their products. It's theirs. It's, they are the authors of the solution and the product. And in the same sense, a digital design professional should feel responsible for its own solution. The next thing is that a digital design professional is a leader in terms of the design perspective in the whole process which means he's not only responsible but he's also making major decisions in terms of functionality in terms of features in terms of budget in terms of timing and so on and then of course he's working on three important areas he's thinking on the business people and technology perspective and consider them all together because only if you understand the business the people's need and the technical capabilities and consider them all in one 
you are able to really create great solutions. This is something that you already have, we have already learned from the design thinking methodology, for example. And to do all this, it's very important to have a, have a feeling, have a sense of the capabilities of technology. And this is what we want to talk about in this webinar. We want to talk about the understanding of digital as shapeable material. If you start thinking in this direction, you might think yourself, woo, this is a bit strange. We typically say digital is something immaterial. It's not there. It's only numbers, ones and zeros. But I learned in the past years developing the digital design professional that this is a misconception. When you talk to other people about material, here, for example, you see a ship welder. He always say it's important to understand your material to really craft great solutions. If you as a welder have not a feeling of the, the steel, the material, the temperature and how it behaves, if you weld it, you will not create great ships here in this example. You will create weak ships which break in the ocean. And in the same sense, we said how it should somehow be possible to grasp this digital this digital thing as a material to understand it in a better way. And when you look at digital as material, the first thing you see is that you have a visual surface. Here you see a screenshot of my desktop preparing this webinar. You see a PowerPoint slide deck, you see mind maps, you see dictionaries, you see other slides, you see that I use iTunes to listen to music, you see a word file somewhere in the background that I use to take notes. And this is a very important part of digital, but it's only the visual surface. There is much more to digital than the things that you see. And to go into the details here, I first want to do some theory, talk about important terminology, and then we'll explain all the terminology with a practical example. The theory is that we believe that digital material, even if it's not material in the physical sense, has a form, function, and quality, and important on two levels, on the perceivable and on the underlying level. Before I go into the terms with respect to digital, I want to share some definitions of the underlying terms here. Form is from the Merriam-Webster dictionary defined as the shape and structure of something as distinguished from its material. Here you see four different cups and all have more or less the same form, but with different material as you see. And the material of course has different properties. It's has different colors. It's transparent, the glass for example, has different, different abilities to um, take hot or cold coffee. And it's really something that you can see. The next thing is the function. The function is the action for which a person or thing is specially fitted or used. Here you can see three different scissors, uh, one for child to cut paper, another one to cut big, uh, yeah, big digant. And the third, the third one is a bonsai scissor. It's from my point of view, the most important one or the most interesting one, because it was specially designed for cutting the bonsai trees. We have a very short scissors and a very strong, strong part for taking the scissor and cutting the trees in a very uh, sharp and a very clear way. And the last term of course is quality. Quality is a inherent feature of something. Here again, you can see the, the four cups again and all have different quality characteristics. They have different feeling. The texture of the material is different. The metal cup is softer, lighter. The uh, ceramics cup is much, much stronger, maybe has a rougher texture and texture. And the, the glass cup also has different, different qualities, but not only visible ones, also physical ones. For example, if you if you drop the glass cup, it's very likely that it will break, whereas the metal cup will take a, will, will remain remain intact and remain usable. And the two in the middle, it's quite difficult to guess what's happening if you're dropping them. And with all these terms, 
you can form function and quality, you can transfer them to the digital world, which I will show you now. Again, the form definition. We have shape and structure of something as distinguished from its material. And the first thing that we understand as a form is the user and the digital solution itself. Here you see a woman taking a picture. Maybe she's posting it on Twitter or on Instagram. But here you can see you have at least two parts. You have the person and you have the solution. And if you look closer, you even see more. You have the person, you have the smartphone as the device that provides the solution, the photography app, and you have the app itself. And this is what we understand as a form. The next thing, of course, is the user interface. You have different building blocks here. You see here the apps. You can see in the background other apps the, the, the user can, can use. You can see different colors. You can see even different behaviors here. But the important thing is that you somehow have a shape. And again, the user also has the device in its hand, which is providing the interface, which means that there is a device and a screen, which we also understand as form. And the next thing, of course, are other elements of a digital solution. When we take the, um, the Instagram or Twitter example, you have not only the app, you have different machines on the back end, which host all the pictures, which communicate with each other, which support the, the apps with new tweets or new pictures. And finally, the last important part of form are the data structures. The data structures of the pictures, of the tweets, of the comments, of everything that is inside the digital solution. And here you can also see the two layers. We, on the one hand, have perceivable form, which is the user interface, the user, the device that the user uses. All these are perceivable forms, which the user or person on the outside can see. And the other example here are um, examples of underlying form which means that these are elements that the user or people from the outside typically cannot see. Here, the network switch, yeah, this is seeable, but when you understand the software components also as elements of these underlying forms, they are not perceivable. They are somehow there running on the different machines, but they are not really perceivable. And the data structures here, you see a, a, a simple class diagram or a simple entity relationship diagram these are structures that you can draw on paper, yes, for sure. But they are when they are running in the digital solution, they are not really perceivable. So we consider them as part of the underlying form. Here also the important difference is that the data structures that you see on the user interface, here you see the different apps represented maybe by data structures. They are not the same as the data models or the structures that are running on the system or on the operating system. The next part is function. Again, action for which a thing is specially fitted or used. Taking a picture, for example, for Instagram or for Twitter, for tweet is a function. You just you push the button, the camera works, provides the picture, and the picture is there and you can use it. It's a function. Another function is posting the picture on Twitter, which is somehow different from the more physical act of taking the picture. But again, it's something that Twitter is designed for. You push the photo in the tweet, write some lines of text, push on send, and the picture is out there available to everybody who's listening to my tweets. Another function is the algorithm or the software that takes the raw data of the picture and creates a JPEG file from it, which we can then use and has, by the way, a very small size that we can transport over the mobile connection of the smartphone to the Twitter service. And finally, maybe some as some social networks are available to um, able to recognize faces. This is also a function, a function provided by artificial intelligence. And it's again a function. 
And if you apply again the notion of perceivable and underlying layer, on the left hand side you see two perceivable functions. Taking a picture is something that the user really can perceive and posting the picture is something the user who posts the tweet and who receives the tweet can also perceive. Whereas on the other hand, the compression is an underlying function, which means that you somehow grasp that there is something is happening with the picture data, but you really do not know the magic behind this. And also how the software recognizes a face is something that is quite underlying. It's not perceivable, it's not visible to the user. And on the last part, the quality, we have again the features. We have the speed of the camera or the algorithm that is compiling the picture is a quality. We have aesthetics of the user interface, the shape, the color, again, is a quality. The scalability of the servers maybe of Twitter or of Instagram is the quality of the solution or the system that is running our solution. And finally, the maintainability of the data model being extendable to incorporate new types of media, new types of entities is a quality. And again, here you can apply the two layers as well. The speed of the camera is something that the user can really perceive. The aesthetics are also something that the user can perceive. And scalability is something that you cannot perceive. You can perceive the speed and you can so, uh, perceive that the solution is there, even if many users are posting their tweets, but it's nothing that you can really see. And therefore we believe that maintainability and scalability are underlying qualities. They have uh, uh, different characteristics. And if you use this terminology, you can, you can use, uh, you can address two different layers, perceivable form function and quality and underlying form function and quality. And from my point of view, this different way of looking at digital technology, I will come to this in a moment, really helps for people that are not familiar with technology in a, in a, in a, in a deep way to get grasp on how to speak technology, how to discuss about technology, how to handle technology and if you if you get the differentiation between perceivable and underlying layer and recognize that they depend of course on each other the speed of the user interface or the app highly depends on the scalability of your system and all the interesting functionalities you can see from from twitter or from from streaming services that recommend for example music to you depends on the power of artificial intelligence and if you get all the difference this here and see that you can capture all these thoughts with very simple terms, namely form, function and quality, it's quite easy to, to, to enter the world of digital technology, which typically looks like this dark room with all the servers and all the lights. And you can apply the terms also to real technology, you know, form, hardware, is end user devices, a tablet is a form, a building block of a smartphone, a camera, a loudspeaker, microphone is form. The touch interaction of a device, audio output and input are functions. The appearance is quality of the form. The ability to play loud music is a function quality and software as an other part. When you talk about user interface libraries, you talk about form. When you talk about the functions of the behavior of a user interface, you talk about function. When you say something about speed recognition, for example, a voice assistant like Siri, you talk about software functions. When you talk about a beautiful user interface, you talk about software quality. When you talk about the precision of Siri to recognize your commands, you talk about function quality. And in the same sense, you can you talk about underlying hardware form, for example, the device uh, components of a device network components, networks of devices, whole data centers, these are form. When you talk about hardware function, for example, Wi-Fi data transmission is a function, or if you have special chips on your device to encrypt your data, you talk about hardware functions. Quality, for example, is the durability of the components, the form quality here, or the bandwidth of your Wi-Fi communication is function quality, and finally, form for software, reusable components, 
for artificial intelligence that you can use open source components, web services, they are form. Deep learning we already had as an example and scalability of your cloud infrastructure. If you use it to host, for example, this webinar, it's a quality of software, it's a scalability here. This, I must confess, these are really far away examples and it may seem very theoretical to talk about these terms. And what I now want to do in the remaining 20 minutes is to share a kind of case study with you. We want to develop a digital solution for long distance running sport. I think running sport is quite popular and there are, when you do a little market survey, you see that there is many digital technology out there. You get smartwatches, you get apps, you can put the apps on your arm to carry it with you. You have map services, you have analysis tools and all these, when you look on them through the view of digital material, you will see some very interesting things. Here, for example, the map, the runner, and this uses the smartphone with a map, you have a form. You have a perceivable form with the user interface, with the runner and the map that is visualized here. And the voice communication between the app and the runner to guide him is also a kind of form. And if you plan a route of a long distance run with this tool, you use a specific function there. And if the app talks to you and says, go right, go left in 300 meters, it's also a function that is provided by the app to guide you. And you need special qualities of this form and function to, in order to be useful. For example, you need precise map data, which enables you to, to the, the, the map to guide you through the area. And of course, you need real-time commands. It's very useless if the if you run uh, 50 meters ahead and the app says, oh, 50 meters ago, you had to turn left. And here, again, you have all these three terms to, to really grasp what the app is doing. But to be really able to do these perceivable functions, you need some underlying form. In the app and in the smartphone, you need a GPS sensor. You need certain data structures, timestamps, position, route data. You need an internet connection to the map set data to get updates from the map or to get the navigation data. You have functions here. You need to calculate the route, which may be done on the server or on the app. And you need to calculate navigation information, which is then transferred into speech to tell you turn left in 20 meters. And again, you have some qualities. You need real time route planning ability. For example, if you change direction, the algorithm must find a new, new route for you to guide you to, the, to your goal. And you need, of course, real-time measurement of your position, of your speed to get the proper, to get the proper um, navigation information. The next thing would be the watch. You have uh, runners wearing smartwatches. You have the housing as a perceivable form, which is a kind of vibration module, touch screens and button. And on the screen, you see also a form map, speed, and maybe the distance that you're running. And it creates some perceivable functions for you. You visualize the data to the runner to track his fitness status. Maybe the the watch warns the runner in case of critical health data, for example, if he has a high pulse. And of course, it must be real-time visualization and real-time warning to make all these things useful. And on the underlying layer, you have again, a lot of underlying form that enables all this. You have a pulse sensor in the watch. You have GPS sensors to get your positions. You need timestamps, position, pulse data, maybe altitude. and you need later a wireless connection to your smartphone to transmit the data. And what the watch is doing is it's measuring your health data, which is an underlying function with the pulse sensor. You need to measure your position and speed, which also is an underlying function. And of course, the communication with the smartphone. And in terms of quality, you have real-time measurement. The next one, the app, the important, Information here is not only the app, but the, in the picture, you also see this arm holder that you can carry the smartphone with you, which says to you that this digital solution is very important to the runner and he wants to wear it during the training. And maybe he also or he, she looks also 
on this data during the training session. And the function here is, of course, to track your fitness status now during the training or maybe afterwards and again visualize critical situations in your health data, maybe a high pulse. And the quality there is a clear presentation of the data. And again, of course, a lot of underlying form here to store the data of the various training sessions to compare them. The data received from the smartwatch is an underlying form or the ability to recognize and visualize critical situations is an underlying function. And here, the quality is a bit different if you are not using the app during a training session, the analysis features do not need that high quality in terms of reaction time. Maybe the smartphone can analyze the data in the background or even the portal behind all this can analyze the data in the background, which is my last example here in the running case study. We have a web portal that uses that the runner uses to study his development. Here you see in the background some, some graphs, some, some diagrams that maybe show the, 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 the training efficiency of the runner, the speed, the pulse data, so that the runner can really analyze his or her fitness status. And again, the main quality is that you need a clear presentation of the data. And on the underlying layer, you have again, the data of various training sessions on a server here. What we see is a website, so we need a server somehow, and we somehow need an underlying form, a way that the portal can receive the data from the smart smartwatch, and again, functions to analyze, analyze critical data. So if you look there from a digital material perspective, we have as a form, the runner, the app, and the web portal, and some data transfer, and if we say who we want to develop something really new we could say who it's all done we have portals we have apps we have watches and there is no room and what i now want to share with you are some thoughts on how to use this material perspective to to really think about new solutions one observation from running sport is that it's a team sport. Runners support each other and sometimes or more often they really coach each other. And what we could think about is that we have artificial intelligence technology with us. We have this nice Siri or Google Assistant. Or, and maybe it's possible that these assistants can talk to us and support us in our running training as real runners do. And if we look there on the material perspective again, we have the watch which delivers health data which we clearly need for analysis. We have smartphones that talk to us. We can ask Siri for the weather tomorrow. It talks to us. Maybe this is no problem at all. We have smartphones with great CPU power. Maybe they are also capable of performing a real-time artificial analysis, an artificial intelligence analysis. This could be possible. But what's difficult is training the artificial intelligence as a running coach. This is something that you only know if you really understand artificial intelligence as a technology. It's not ready out of the box. You need to train it. And in order to train it, you need all the data. But in order to get the data, you somehow have the business running. And this is, this is the point where, from my point of view, the digital design professional becomes important because a, a technical expert in artificial intelligence will tell you, yeah, sure, you can train an AI to become a running coach. This is possible. Give me sufficient training data and I will do it for you. But from a business perspective, it's really difficult to get the data because you cannot really buy it. You somehow have to build a solution that collects the data, but why should people care about the solution if they get no benefit from it? And so somehow from a technical point of view, although that artificial intelligence sounds interesting, it's not, maybe not the right way to do. So I wanna share another observation with you. If you look at runners in the park, you see runners very often wearing headphones and carrying their smartphones with them to listen to music, maybe even to a podcast, maybe on running sport, and maybe also having a phone call with a friend. And when you come back to the coaching scenario, what if the person on the other end of the phone call is a running coach? 
wouldn't it be possible to create, for example, a scenario like this, a coach somewhere sitting in an office, watching to your health data and talking to you over a voice connection, giving you instructions because he sees all your training data and he's experienced and can support you. When we look on this thing, on this idea through our digital material perspective, we again have the picture with the watch and the runners app. And we have the coach as a second person in our digital solution, which somehow talks to us through a voice connection. And what the coach also needs is this kind of portal solution which communicates with us, which transports the voice data to the runner. And when you start looking through the digital material perspective on this, you have a perceivable form, namely the runner and the smartwatch and the headphones and the smartphone that is connected to the portal and the coach, the other part of our digital solution, uses the portal and the portal shows maybe map data and training data of our runner to the coach. And the function of this solution is quite easy. The coach talks with the runner and the coach sees the run to run runner's training data on the portal and interprets the data and gives the runner some advice over the communication line. And the main issue here is of course, the quality in terms of real time. It's only working if all this is possible in real time or in nearly real time so that the, the coach can see all the important data and give advice to the runner. And to enable this, we need some underlying form here. We need an app that sends the health data. We again need the portal. We need the training data, the data points. We need the watch that is able to measure all this. And we need the smartphone that compiles the data, the voice connection, maybe even the bi-directional communication could also be possible. And again, as a quality, it's important to have real time there. And when you compare both solutions, we have on the right hand side, the artificial intelligence running coach, which sounds quite sexy, by the way, which maybe it's interesting to explore in this direction. And on the other hand, you have the remote coach. We will see that our remote coach sounds realizable and feasible, because it could be easier to find, find coaches that are willing to support us here on our portal, than to be able to train an artificial intelligence to coach a runner. And in the long term, maybe it's possible to combine both ideas, but this is a different story. And what I really want to, to emphasize here is that you really get the ability to think about all these parts of digital material, of digital technology with all the terminology I just presented. It's quite easy to talk about the form, about the function, and the quality on an underlying and perceivable level without having deep technical expertise. And the important thing is here also, you can ask the important questions to technical experts. For example, is it possible to provide real-time voice communication over a mobile phone internet connection, which should be possible. We are using it almost every day when we use Skype or Teams or something like this over a smartphone connection. And all this is part of our digital design professional program. In the foundation level, we really want to teach you all the interesting details, insights that I just presented about digital technology. We want to motivate why digital design is important and want to teach the essential basics and selected methods that you can really start to do digital design after the training. And it's not only a broad overview to, to, to perform all the methods. It's also, under, we also understand this training as a kind of map that you can understand what really is the competence profile of a good digital design professional to, to look for additional training opportunities. For example, if you're interested in interface design, you will see how interface design fits into the whole digital design process and can extend your abilities there. And the curriculum consists of six chapters. We provide an introduction. We go very deep into design competence, which was not part here of this webinar, but you will learn how processes are related to digital design. You will learn how conceptual work is working. I will show you 
once two simple examples afterwards. And you will also learn a lot about prototyping, which is also a very important tool for design. You learn about digital material. This is one part was this webinar. You learn about technology, about the form, function, and quality, about underlying and perceivable technology. We have cross-cutting competences, which includes, for example, business models, which we consider very important to understand. Here, for example, with the running coach case study, it's quite important to understand that developing an artificial intelligence coach is much more expensive from an investor side than relying on the remote human coach because you can actually start the solution with very few coaches whereas when you start to train your ai coach you need a lot of upfront investment to really get the solution running the fifth, fifth chapter deals with a real hands-on practical building process. Here we combine state-of-the-art elements like Scrum, like design thinking, like minimum viable product. You will learn how to incorporate lean startups into your processes. It's really important to get started right away after the training. And finally, the last unit is about good digital design. It's about quality. It's a lot. I all, uh, talked a lot about the quality in this webinar, but here we give 10 important principles that are related to good digital design. For example, about usability, about scalability, about also preferring analog means where necessary. And what's also part of the material is the case study I just showed to you. We have the, we call it YPRC, your personal running coach, which is a full-fledged example of a digital solution. It includes a story which you can download here from the webinar, which explains you how we as a group created the digital solution with various artifacts. It has the components I just described and it's we use it for example, here you can see a screenshot of one digital design concept. We really use it to explain the processes, we use it to explain the artifacts, and we use it to clear, make clear how all the techniques that we use are take place in such a scenario. To conclude my talk, what's very important for me is that digital design is not a replacement of all the existing roles and disciplines. We believe that digital, the digital design professional will really empower business analysts, requirements engineers, usability designers to cope with all the challenges that innovative technologies and the design of the solution will take. So if you consider yourself as part of this picture with digital design, you will get an additional competence field and understand in a very deep way the relationship of material and technology with all your existing skills and profile what i wanted to tell you is how to understand digital as a material it's very much like welding digital material can be shaped you can use it to form solutions we had three different views form function and quality and of course two different layers which are as important as form function and quality because you can understand digital only if you understand that it has a perceivable layer and an underlying layer that enables it. And finally, it's very important for me in the case study that the idea of digital is a material that you can really shape. Here we use the remote running and the AI coach as a proper example. And as a more or less final statement, we always get the question if this digital design professional is a new role. And I clearly say no there are sufficient roles in IT and what we want to do is we provide a whole new profession that is able to build bridges between the existing roles and show how we believe that competence, design competence in IT has to be developed. Roles are something that are up to the projects that will use these competences. And now you may say, wow, design is something that we had some for quite a long time and what designers do is they create products for mass production. And this is, of course, true. And this way of working does not work for software. All the agile community teaches us these insights every day. In software, we have somehow iterative requirements and development processes. And 
this is of course true and in our program we will come to all these details and explain how the relationships between agile development processes and high, highly sophisticated design process in terms of digital products work. So stay tuned, we will have some more webinars with modern analysts. So if you're interested in the topic, maybe we will hear and see us again. And to close my talk again, the important lesson from the building architects it's quite difficult to develop a new viewpoint on something that's out there for quite a while but i really believe that the ideas of form function and quality and the underlying and perceivable layer for digital material is really something that will help us in the future to talk with our customers to talk with developers to get a better understanding of ourselves on how digital material and technology works and in the same sense as architects learn about the perception of architecture this talk was about the perception of digital material and i hope you will use the insights from my webinar to become greater digital designers somewhere in the future so thank you very much and this was my talk on the digital design professional perfect thanks kim um really interesting um, presentation and so um, if you are interested in digital design professional or in digital design in general um, just visit us please on our website www.digitaldesign.org and he can also get in contact with us um, send us some questions and then so on and as mentioned in the beginning on um, the education scheme will be available in fall this year um, anyhow we will have some additional webinars um, with uh, modern analysts this year and they will also be listed in on our website so thanks a lot and handing over to the question part thank you stan and thank you kim for such a great presentation today we are going to begin answering questions that have been submitted during the session. As a reminder, you can still type your questions into the questions box. And also there is a handout for you in the handout sections that you can download. Kim, our first question from Osan. Uh, he says, thanks for the presentation. He enjoyed it very much. This holistic thinking is very critical for an entrepreneur or maybe a product manager in my mind. And can you elaborate more on how digital design thinking can be integrated into the business analyst or the product owner role without the overall responsibilities or authorities of a product manager? Okay, yeah, that's a that's an interesting and really difficult question. We, we, we very often discuss about all these relationships between the responsibilities of the various roles. What I believe is that the, the digital design professional will also get uh, input information on digital business models, which I just talked about, the cross-cutting competencies. And I really believe that the, the the business part of the business analyst and the the business part of the digital design professional really complement each other and if you work as a product owner and you don't have the let's say the authority to decide all the important things with a digital design professional education you will get much better arguments for your senior management to explain why you want to go into certain directions why you need for example a certain budget for developing maybe a prototype to explore the abilities of artificial intelligence. And here I really believe that this will be very useful so that you can explain it better to your managers and also better talk to the technical people because of the additional technical background you have. Thank you, Kim. We have a couple of requests for um, uh, restating uh, the quote you used on selfishness during the beginning of the presentation and then also right after that the definition of vortex sorry what which one the uh, near the beginning of the session that someone wanted love the quote about selfishness and if you could tracy, restate that tracy if yes. i can interject uh it looks like a, a question further down or a statement that person was on two different webinars and got confused so we can <laughs> avoid okay. we can leave that alone Okay. Thank you, Chris. My apologies. Let's go on to your next question then. Um, and this is a question 
and also a, a comment for you to expand on. Uh, question is, I noticed that when describing the form, function, and quality, that function relates to what system designers usually describe as functional requirements, while quality relates to what system designers often describe as non-functional requirements. And it also seems to overlap with UI design and user experience. Yes. Sure. And finally, the, the common and questions coming, but finally, form seems to describe the physical and logical structures of any product or system. And Kim, do you agree with this? And would you like to expand on any of this? Thanks. Yes, I, I think uh, he or she is perfectly right. I mean, the, 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 the things that, that, for example, functional requirements or non-functional or quality requirements, however you want to call this, they are all outside there as terms. And what we use is we use other terms to describe somehow the same, the same universe. But the main difference here is, for example, when you talk about requirements, functional or non-functional requirements, you always have the notion that there is something already existing. And I've I worked a lot in the requirements world and always it's always very difficult, for example, for customers or users to, to think in this abstraction layers of requirements. If you clearly talk about functions or qualities in a direct sense and say, which function do you want? And do not try to hide it on a, an additional level called functional requirement. It's it's more, much more easy for them to to communicate about the solution. And um, it's I very often experience discussions in projects about which statement really is a requirement and which not. And therefore, we really prefer to talk about form and function as direct entities that we want to have and restrict the term requirement only to quality. If you carefully look at the, the, the examples, all the qualities are quality requirements of the form, of the function. And in this sense, I think I we present a different, uni, different universe of terms to describe the things at hand, which are, from my point of view, easier to use for newbies in the field and also for users, customers, and stakeholders. Thank you, Kim. It looks like we have time for just one more question. Daryl is asking, he received an MFA in web design and new media from the Academy of Art University. Mm -hmm. This three years master's program involved user research, interaction design, web technologies, UK design, and usability testing process. Uh, I'm interested in this digital design professional, but want to know if it would be redundant for me. Yeah, it's. I, I know these programs and they, they are great in terms of um, the perceivable layer, if you if you use my own terminology. All, all the things you described, you described all, are also only related to perceivable form, the visibility, and to all the uh, methods and techniques to deal with this. So if the, the digital design professional would be a, a good extension if um, on the on the underlying level to understand all the technical implications there. This is the first part, and the second important part from my point of view is the 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 process perspective, which was not part here of the webinar, but which is really important to apply all the competencies that these programs transport. In practice, I very often experience highly educated user interface designers, user researchers that are not able to, 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 to connect to the processes in the project and to find the right point in time where to incorporate their abilities. For example, the interface designers are very important at the beginning of a project to define the overall shape and during the implementation. And these are aspects that the digital design professional will offer. It will explain to you where which part of the competence profile of such programs are applicable and important so that managers and people who have these competences are better able to decide when to join a project and when to support with their competences. Thank you, Kim. And it looks like we've run out of time for today's session, but thank you, Kim, for such a great session today. 
And we'd also like to thank IREB for sponsoring today's event. Thanks for all that attended today's Modern Analyst webinar. I'd like to remind everyone that today's webinar, along with the slides, will be archived at the modernanalyst.com website within a few business days. And this concludes today's event. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks. Bye-bye.